Welcome to the Cannabis Reporter Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, Snowden Bishop. In my quest to learn more about cannabis, I speak with a lot of people. Some are seasoned experts and some are newcomers to the cannabis industry who are learning to navigate through the ever-changing legal landscape. But what I've noticed about those who are most successful in this business, they share a common denominator, passion. This is especially true of my guests today. I had the pleasure of spending the better part of my morning with Elizabeth Valentine. As the owner of Green Star Doctors in Phoenix, Arizona, she uses her exceptional knowledge to guide patients through the medical marijuana licensing process and educate them about how to buy and use marijuana to treat their own medical conditions. More importantly, she plays a vital role in helping patients overcome the stigma that's been ingrained in our culture for generations. This is especially true of young people who intuitively gravitate toward cannabis for reasons they may not be entirely sure, but must deal with the shame and fear associated with prior pressure to just say no to drugs. As you'll soon hear, Liz Valentine has a unique perspective on why. I hope you enjoy the interview. Let me just start by asking you about your incredible story, because I know there is one. Sure, absolutely. We started in Denver. I was general manager of three dispensaries that I helped build from the ground up. And together with that team that I helped build, we started our pioneering in the medical marijuana industry. Mm. Denver was still developing. It was brand new. Um, It's a for-profit state, so everyone could put their applications in, and it was survival of the fittest. Right. It was just a beautiful place to come into. There were so many stigmas attached, and we knew that we needed to bring people in and make them feel comfortable. What year was this again? 2009. 2009. Okay, so really early days. Really, really early. We got our applications in. Within three months, those three dispensaries were open. Okay. Within the two years, we acquired seven or eight dispensaries before I left. Wow. So I was the buyer of all product between flour and edibles and concentrates and non-smokable items. Right. It was a full gamut. And back then, the variety was a lot less than it is now. Absolutely. And a lot less was known publicly about differences in formulations. Absolutely. It was a new horizon. Yeah. And edible makers that had their own licenses were coming about. Different manufacturers of different products were just testing their market. And I helped some of them with their progress on packaging and developing what I thought would be good for the end buyer, our patients. Right. I helped get people legal. We worked with the doctor. I was a notary. We notarized all of the applications okay. on site. We had the doctor on premise with in within the dispensary. And it was actually much easier for the patient to not have two separate trips and have the education with the doctor at the dispensary. Did you have trouble finding doctors at that time who were interested in making the transition into this space? It is easy to find doctors. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, the, the norm is that you know if you work for a hospital or a practice that don't believe in that, then of course the stigma lives on and those people, you know, worrying about their reputation, Mm -hmm. don't find it. But there are a lot of doctors who do believe in this. And um, of course, in Arizona, because we have naturopaths on board, it's just a little bit more open-minded. It would be, I would think, with the osteopath, naturopath, and homeopathic doctors. Absolutely. But Arizona is pretty conservative. What made you come here as opposed to going to, let's say, Illinois first? It was timing. Um, I had gone to ASU when I was younger. Oh, okay. So you had a connection here I first. I did. And I, I realized that they had a great law, and that was something that was a 
obvious. Mm -hmm. All the different laws in, in the states really pivot how you can build your success in the industry. Mm -hmm. And so it looked like a good thing. And so you plan to expand into Illinois as well? Yes, and New York and all around the valley we will be opening up. I know that there's a limitation on dispensaries yes. and how many can be in certain places. What about the licensing and... There's no limitation. And what I've found is that people want to go closer to the area. Mm -hmm. And even though I have travelers of four hours away coming to my office, it would be nice to help people from the distances that can't get to us. What are the services that most people come in for? And what, what are some of the most common reasons people come to see you? Well, first, they definitely come in to get certified. Right. And then, of course, we help them with their application. Um, I think my cannabis experience brings people in. Um, there's a lot of word of mouth, and people trust my opinion. Um, I do have a lot of experience with cannabis and flower and the industry itself now after seven years. So I've become a little bit of both a good service for just the regular thing you need to come in for and then maybe a little bit more information of what's really going on. You're so knowledgeable Perfect. in a way that I've talked to a lot of people and I will be talking to a lot of people that are very you know, they're in their group. They have a lot of expertise in what it is that they do. Mm -hmm. But you seem to have, like, this really well-rounded take mm -hmm. on all of this. And from your perspective, having the clinic, Green Star. And I'll tell you that um, I'm also that little bit of an advocate for newbies. Tell me about some of your early, early, early experience with cannabis. Oh, early experience? My personal experiences? Uh -huh. Well, if you don't mind, I don't mind at all. I, I love the plant for all its uh, um, anonymity. You know, um, I first smelled it in a concert and thought, what's that? It smells so good. Of course, I grew up in a strict household that was anti drugs. Mm -hmm. So I did not believe in it necessarily. When I heard that friends were doing it, I didn't really get the grasp of why mm -hmm. um, until I did and I didn't really have a good appetite as a child had a lot of ADHD a lot of excess energy and it really did calm me down it gave me an appetite things I wouldn't have expected a drug quote-unquote to do mm -hmm. because those were always thought of as just partying or um, for fun's sake for escape right. and um, I found the contrary I found it gave me hope and life in ways that were beneficial in my health and things that I could not have understood early on as a I think I tried it at 18 19 it helped you with school from that point forward absolutely oh, it helped yeah. my focus um, it, it gave me a lot of energy Mm -hmm. And it doesn't yet necessarily do that for everyone. How many children do you see? Minors? I want to say that it's not as many as you'd think. I probably have a dozen that have come through over the years of being here. Right. And what are some of the most common things they ask about? Ask about or have? Well, they have. Cancer. Childhood cancer. Childhood cancer and maybe severe injuries from sports, things of that yeah. nature that really need medication and attention. I wonder how many children are out there who are high school age going through that terrible angst mm -hmm. and getting into trouble not because of the impact of smoking marijuana, sure. but because it's illegal for them to be smoking marijuana. I wonder how many children actually gravitate toward that and I'm saying this because you're in a unique position because you're in the business of making people legal. Mm -hmm. But what kind of message can we get out to moms who are concerned about their kids, mm -hmm. you know, running with the rogue crowd and smoking pot, you know, but sure. maybe they're gravitating toward it because they have anxiety or ADHD naturally finding their path to cannabis. What could we tell them? 
without promoting children smoking pot, for example. Okay. Here's what I'm going to say. This is my deep thing about um, why it's a gravitational pull for people. If if you're going to stigmatize somebody who's young, let's say, who decides that, I think I'm going to smoke pot, what are you saying to not only that individual but everyone else that that they don't have a higher self gravitating towards something that is right. beneficial for them, that they could be preventing, that you have no idea about. Mm -hmm. It's very upsetting that we want to control why, you know, it's it's part of the stigma. You're a criminal, so if you decide to go that way, you're right. bad. Mm -hmm. Instead of, we have an inner voice that propelled us to go against the grain. Yeah. There's a fine line between promoting illegal activity sure. and discussing the benefits of it. I find this challenging as a writer. Um, a couple of things. You hit on a great nerve for me because I, I see everybody coming in, you know, nervous and shaking off their views of themselves after being judged by society mm -hmm. is our biggest problem. We end up not realizing that we, we tend to emotionalize the criminal mind, that we give a self-fulfilling prophecy to everyone, children as well, that you're bad for doing this. And that stigma is so difficult to remove when you know it helps you. It calms your anxieties down so that you can have focus, so that you can do whatever you need in your life. It is definitely medicinal if it helps you eat and you have no hunger. There's nothing in pill version, pharmaceutically, that promotes hunger. So you're doing a good service by taking something that's non-lethal, non-toxic, versus the choices out there. Oh, yeah. So for the moms, I would say it's not going to hurt them. And if it helps them, then look for that benefit. I see the positive in it. The worst thing we can do is what has been done already, which is make someone feel like a criminal. Mm -hmm. because they come in shaking that they're going to be judged, that they're coming out of the closet, that they just need it for their benefit, for health, mm -hmm. and they're still fighting the emotional stigma. And when people come in with really large symptoms and still feel like a criminal, it just saddens me because we're not criminals tax-paying citizens, everyone who's ever been in my office has been a pillar of society. Mm -hmm. Of course, there may be a percentage of those that may be struggling e economically, and then they look a certain way in their anxieties, but they're not criminals for wanting to help themselves. Mm -hmm. So we put that stigma out there, and it creates worse trauma that's much more difficult to remove. Right. Well, and we're talking 80 years of, of shame and stigma That's around right. marijuana. We don't recognize that it was a part of our history. Oh, for, for thousands of years. Right. And so the best thing to do is to not make the children feel like criminals so that they don't grow up the rest of their life looking over their shoulder and feeling bad for their choice to be non-toxic, non-lethal. Right. How many people come in here, do you think, that have that have ongoing prescriptions for opioids? More than There's half. Really? More than half. How many of those do you think have a huge dependency? At least 30%. You can see that they struggle with, they need both because they can't live without their pills. And, and then let me ask you this. Sure. I'm getting to something. Okay, yes. How many of the people who do come in with uh, frequent opioid prescriptions go off the opioids having been here. We see at least 20%. And it doesn't sound like a lot. It takes time for somebody to understand what cannabis is doing for them and their will to get off what has helped them till now. Right. And of those, how many do you think find what they need in cannabis to address the pain and, well, pain and addiction. It helps so all around. I call it a cure-all. Right. You know, it calms the system in every way, mentally, physically, 
So it must help them combat the side effects of all those pills. Right. That's really what happens. They have to make the, the jump to realize that cannabis can help them all the way through. Mm -hmm. They probably have to get over the hurdles of the lack of information outside of flour. Right. There's benefits to edibles that smoking may not be able to reach. Mm -hmm. But people get scared of edibles because dosing has not figured out a way to be so regulated. Right. So there's different makers and different products, and then the quality of the products going into the products. It's, well, and also, if something's yummy, you might have more of it. Right, and then the scary stories of all of the you know emergency room visits because they've taken too much. You know, there's definitely a lot of reasons why people tend to stay within their small circle and then maybe they're not getting the benefits of, of cannabis in its entire menu, mm -hmm. you know. And I also believe that in Arizona they did a disservice by not giving edible licenses out separately so that different smaller um, legal companies could be born when one person has the license for everything and they deem what is important to them to manufacture within their grow because they need enough flour or they need enough wax and you know concentrates and then edibles is a huge line if you say edible it could be anything right so if you only make brownies you're limiting so much right. because of the delivery system yeah and so in Colorado it is all separate licenses and in other states, they're all also separate licenses, some, some states. Some are all-inclusive as well, and it's not the best idea because by the time one company can figure out all the funding that it takes to grow these factories, basically, what well, they'll turn yeah, into. No pun intended. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is, this is a big industry that, yes, needs regulation, but not in a monopoly way. Right, and so we've created here in Arizona, I think, the environment for monopolies. Absolutely. You know, we have the measure vying for signatures right now, regulate marijuana like alcohol, marijuana policy project version. And I'm wondering if, if they're going to be addressing any of those issues with the licensing and all of that. Um, I am familiar to a point on this. these two bills are giving grow rights to each patient, which is fabulous, but it does nothing to the medical law to adjust the 25 mile rule. Mm -hmm. So theoretically it could be both, but I don't believe that taking out the medical law, let's say the medical law was revised so that it was as beautiful it could be mm -hmm. for a patient. I don't believe Washington did a good idea by taking medical out altogether. It sends the message that it's just a drug and have your fun. Right. So medical patients need guidance. They trust a doctor, not just the people selling them. Yeah. Their products. Now that's a whole other kettle of fish. Thank because you. right now, the way it is, a dispensary bud tender, if you will, yes. has to be an advisor, a practitioner, a pharmacist and there are so many different formulations and I think that the people who've been in the business long enough probably didn't get any formal training they've learned on the job that's right so what do you tell patients when they come in here about you know hey beware they might sell you the best kush but they're not going to tell you what you need for your cancer that too and there's no regulations in Arizona that prohibit them to put things on the shelf with spider mites and powder mildew <sighs> So there are a lot of things I try to tell the patients to educate them on what they're going to see. I tell them about a smell test. Pick it up, smell it. If it smells bad like mold, don't buy it. If it doesn't have a scent and it's dry, it's like hay, don't buy it. It's expensive. This medicine is not cheap. Mm -hmm. So if you're not trying to give your end user, the patient, the best product, you're just hurting them. So these monopolies with no laws to regulate, it's pretty scary. Right. Um, I try to give them as much information as possible because I have been smoking over 20 years. So I, I can understand um, 
what it's like on each strain, my perception, it's just an opinion, but it's better than um, someone who's just reading an article mm -hmm. about the strain. Mm -hmm. So it, there is a difference between those people who are in the community and working in the industry and affecting people without knowledge, mm -hmm. like growers that don't smoke. These are a little difficult challenges. You have to have some idea of what you're making. Mm -hmm. And there comes the passion. <laughs> if you have passion for it because it helps you, then you will help others because it benefits you. You can explain to others how it benefits you and hopefully it'll benefit them that way. Right. Wow, and sorting out the, the difference in the dispensaries and all of that, I think that's, a, that's going to be a challenge. And I'm passionate about the issues around cannabis because I think it's, you know, God's gift to the earth and we're Absolutely. stupid for not using it. Right. But I, I think that we're going to start seeing some business-minded people entering the space because they see the huge profit potential. The other thing I'm really scared of, too, which is why I'm glad it's still a state issue, is, is the fact that it's going to be a really interesting challenge when, when it does finally legalize nationwide because there are such vast differences between the laws. Once it does blow, you're going to see the big pharmaceutical companies sure. and agricultural companies come in and start monopolizing the industry and all of that. So I guess, you know, we're at an advantage right now that it's just a state-run thing. Mm -hmm. I do believe it should be federally legal. Yes, of course. Okay, so I do believe that everyone should be able to grow it on their own and have all of their choices free, freely. Mm -hmm. um, but since that's not the case and we're regulated by the states and it's man-made laws, it, it makes sense to have recreation but it does not make sense to give those in a recreational format more liberties, liberties. than the one who's fighting medical issues, mm -hmm. who are more serious about it, which in Colorado, the standardization of the medical side having more quantity or more plant count, it shows allegiance to those that are truly sick. Mm -hmm. It is a bit challenging, I think, and it's going to be for you, this is a question, when you start expanding into different states, because okay. each state law is so different, right. how are you supporting that? Do you have a, do you have a, a legal team that's working with you on those issues, right. on the differences and that sort of thing, or is it not going to impact you that much? Each state has its requirements mm -hmm. and its guidelines. And they're not too difficult to decipher the differences. Right. Um, it's an interesting thing because they try to follow one state or another. Colorado, sometimes Arizona. You know, Nevada was looking at Arizona. Arizona was looking at Colorado. So they're not too far apart from right. how they really set themselves up. California, I think, is still the wild, wild west when it comes to the laws of mm -hmm. marijuana. I really, really want to know, from your perspective as a business owner, what is it that you want people to know the most? That the pot smokers that you consider to be bad are not. We're good people. We're thinkers. You mentioned the black sheep syndrome. Tell me what you think that is. Okay, so... Um, the black sheep of society syndrome. You know, when you're casted to be a criminal because you decided to do something away from the norm, like smoke pot, it's something non-toxic, non-lethal that you decide on your own. And now everyone looks at you like you're a degenerate. And you have to fight that. And you're already battling whatever it is within you that you've needed cannabis and you're also fighting everyone else's version of you now. And it's detrimental to society to do that to people. We should be kind to each other and make sure that they have what they need and not judge for what they need. And maybe ask intelligent questions instead of speak down to us like we're just dummies. 
And there are several people in life that you can see that have smoked pot like Steve Jobs and, and not been a blithering idiot. You know, they peg us to be a kid on the couch playing video games. And we are mature men and women of all ages, grandmas and grandpas, just getting off their pills. And it's just not criminal nation the way they want to peg on us. So it would be better for tomorrow's society to get rid of this stigma now. We see that it helps people, especially seizure patients, to have it in their system. We have an endocannabinoid system in our body, but nobody wants to talk about the fact that we could all use this instead of a cup of joe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and or and a cup of joe. But I do believe that the biggest thing I'd like to tell people in my mission in the cannabis industry would be that we're good people and stop chastising us for our choices. So when you don't know how you're going to feel, I kind of give you a little bit of like a chat and I ease you into it. And right. This is what I would say to you, but we all had to figure out how many Tylenols we needed at one point. They, we can gauge certain things. You know, we all know when to stop eating. You know, there's, um, a, our brain does a lot for us. Right, <laughs> right. You can start gauging how you feel right. with it. And then you know exactly what it's doing to you. And then you can, you, you may even get your tolerance up and you increase your dosing. But you'll always be able to manage it because it's, not something that's like an opiate that's going to take you too far away. Mm -hmm. And that's the illusion. People are always thinking that it's going to take them to la-la land. Right. And it doesn't unless you do too much. So if you add, you know, a little bit incrementally, then you can't go too crazy. It won't take you to overboard. Right. So cannabis isn't scary, but because the stigma and the association to it and, of course, there are some stories of people who have had um, unregulated dosing. But, and the biggest loss of a cannabis patient, if you start off new and you have a bad experience, then you don't tend to, oh, you write it off. It's bad because they could have maybe had the pivot of a better experience. Right. And so it, it really is practical to have it in almost a, a safe environment at home, in the daytime, where you can feel at your best, regulated, um, somebody with experience around you, and then to not feel so serious about it, like it's surgery. Because right. the, the paranoia of, oh my God, I don't know what I'm going to feel, it's like before you get on an amusement park ride and you're like, is this going to shake me all around? Am right. I going to throw up? People are scared of the actual experience. And I believe that that brain is telling you fear, 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 and you all, boom, you're in a bad experience already. So if we can give people a little bit more ease into the environment instead of black or white, you know, right. black sheep or white sheep of society, which, you know, it's... Right. It, well, and also tell them that when they get their medical marijuana card, they don't want to go first thing out of the gate and get, you know, 18% THC. That's right. That's true. And don't take six hits. Right. Take one. See and how see you feel. How, see how it does. Okay. Because yes. I definitely want to be able to put my input out there, yeah. but I believe that by myself it's not enough. Like a few people that have expertise and can chime in. Because eventually I definitely believe that um, I have that purpose to like get my voice out there. Opinions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you for for talking to me. I mean, this is this is great. So, um, you have inspired me. Okay. Sure. No, so. I totally believe in this. It's it's something that it is important. It's so important. It really is. And honestly, um, I got into this because of hemp. And my passion started cool. with hemp. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. And you know, right now it's like you know we're 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 trying to think outside of the box because there are a lot of uh, marijuana publications out there. 
mm-hmm. there aren't a lot of publications out there that are going, trying to go to moms and conservatives who are completely opposed to marijuana, right. who listen to the people who are going, sure. it's a gateway drug, and right. just say no, and, you know, all of these things. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're counter-programming the typical programming that's out there sure. about marijuana. That's awesome. And, and I think that that's sort of an important niche. Part of why the stigma is there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You may not have good results. I, I'm definitely spoofing the stigma. People don't think I smoke. I smoke a lot. Yeah. But it doesn't phase me. I can be the poster child of doing all my work, and, and I need to smoke. Right. So. But I think that that's what's good about me is that I'm at the age where um, you can take me seriously. Mm-hmm. I'm a business owner in the industry, and so I, I may have a different clout than just the regular smoker. Right. But since I am such a heavy user, I would like to push back all those people who think that you can't have both. Success and yeah. integrity it's, and right. it's all untrue. of those things. Absolutely. Well, and also the modern pothead, you know, <laughs> like the glam side of it, the business side of it, yeah. as people come out of the closet. Cannabis unites people, uh-huh. and it really takes away so many borders you know, you've got the gay lesbian community, and that's a big community. And let's say you have the biker community or the religious mm-hmm. community. Everyone, there's a lot of communities. Right. They all cross section in cannabis. Religion doesn't unite as much as cannabis does. Right. So there's really it really well. And the lines. the anti cannabis is the war on drugs, right. but also just inner city wars. Right. Got the criminal justice system. Um, anti-establishment right. that segregated all of these groups. As long as the jails still keep making money, they're going to keep chasing it's after it. It's a huge it. lobby. So you have so many people smoking cannabis. We cannot all be blithering idiots. <laughs> you know, there there are prosecutors, city attorneys, right, attorneys yeah. general and state that are all doing judges. Yeah, yeah and it it, it's so <laughs> hypocritical exactly. because so many people do. Steve Jobs. Let's let's continue this conversation for sure. It's so great to talk to you guys. Thank you so, so nice much. Thank you, thank you again. So thank much. you. Um, this is great. Wow. I'd like to personally thank Liz Valentine for sharing her passion, knowledge, and time with us here today. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Please visit us online at thecannabisreporter.com to learn more about today's topic or to subscribe to our weekly podcasts. From all of us at The Cannabis Reporter, thank you for listening. Until we meet again, make it a great day. Evergreen is calling, evergreen is always, where I be blind. The blue is blue falling, and sheets made for